You're listening to Journey for Truth with internationally known medium, Tai Yi practitioner, and radio host, Tammy Urbanic. Hello and welcome to Journey for Truth on iHeartRadio and YouTube. Thank you for joining me. I'm Tammy Urbanic. Journey for Truth is always on demand and with many new episodes. On JonahLifeInstitute.com, you can sign up for their free newsletter. In the newsletter, you're going to see a lot of information on healing, seminars, questions and answers regarding a variety of topics as it relates to healing. And of course, again, it's free. Go to JonahLifeInstitute.com and sign up for that newsletter. My guest this week is April Hanna and Michael Habernig, director and producer of the documentary The Path, which discusses spirituality, evolving, the afterlife, and even remote viewing. April and Michael, welcome. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks for having Hi, us on. Now, how was the idea of this documentary born? Well, back in 2007, I went through a period of time where a lot of people in my family were uh, actually a lot of friends and family were actually dying. <laughs> uh, some were natural causes, some were uh, tragic events, uh, unexpectedly. And over, t- over that course of time, I really wanted to research what was you know, life after death. Um, I grew up a uh, very, very strict Catholic uh, upbringing, uh, though I kind of hit the wall with that to dive deeper into this understanding afterlife and you know what goes on beyond life and so I was doing research and I was listening to interviews and reading books from like Thomas Campbell, William Buhlman and other um, experts who have had near-death experiences or uh, um, uh, you know uh, experiences like that and after doing this research I probably did probably about eight to ten months of research and then I finally figured you know why can't this be in like a film format I I have a a TV uh, film background so I figured maybe I should just put this into a a film that you know other people might want to watch that are in my situation so uh, I kind of hunted around you know the local area just looking up um, uh, people who have, have maybe have had near-death experiences. Um, I got really involved with people who had out-of-body experiences and past life returns, and also uh, Reiki uh, healers. Um, I worked between this energy that they were using as well as some of the um, uh, experiences that people had. I knew there was a connection somewhere. Mm-hmm. So I actually found April nearby and she was in the next town over and we met and I said you know I, I kind of pitched her the idea and I'd like to interview her and I wanted to know more about Reiki and, and with a whole idea that maybe this could be you know start out just putting clips on YouTube uh, but as we got talking and um, putting the thing together uh, we, we figured that this might go better as a, a film mm-hmm. or, yeah, and actually turned out to be a film series right very interesting, and I know that a lot of people are very interested in consciousness and evolving and spirituality, and and there are many people out there who do question what happens after the physical body dies. Is there, uh, you know, so called a life after death? Do we reincarnate? Are there past lives, future lives, and so on and so forth? And they're very legitimate and valid questions. And I did watch uh, the documentary that you two created, The Afterlife, and it was full of uh, wonderful information, a lot of information that I have learned over the course of my life regarding consciousness, regarding suicide, what happens after the physical body dies. So I I definitely encourage the listeners to uh, find your documentaries and to watch them because they are, is, is full of great information. Now... Since your films do discuss consciousness, how do you interpret consciousness? Well, thank you. good question. Um, I believe that Mike and I, we're still on our journey of trying to answer that question even for ourselves. You know, with the trilogy series, The Path After Life is the first movie, and that was really trying to document and answer some of Mike's questions, some of my questions as well as, you know, is there really life after death? Can we prove this? You know, what is consciousness? And then as we interviewed these experts in the field, I think both of us felt pretty settled to know that we do go on or that consciousness continues and that, 
you know, the whole concept of energy that, you know, it can't be destroyed. It just takes a different form. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that we both kind of adapt to that and believe in that. And then the second film, The Path Beyond the Physical, takes people more into that journey of, well, what do you do as consciousness? Like, what's this whole remote viewing thing? And how people are going out of body, what does that mean? And both Mike and I experienced and tried to practice that ourselves, and we both had out-of-body experiences during the making of the film. And then that kind of, at least personally for me, really helped me to shed my fear of what we term as death, Mm -hmm. you know, and and really feeling comfortable in knowing that this really is just a journey and I'm using my physical body as a tool to kind of maneuver experiences here on Earth. And then our third film that we just released this year, The Path Evolution, really dives even deeper into some of the theories of consciousness out there. And we follow uh, the former NASA nuclear physicist, Tom Campbell, who really looks at his theory in saying that we're all kind of in this virtual reality system, very Mm -hmm. similar to uh, a video game. And, you know, how we maneuver and kind of play this game is really, I guess, in essence, the goal is just trying to evolve as spirit, as soul, as consciousness, instead of de-evolving, in, in kind of his terms. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think what we found, too, again, personally, uh, what I like to believe my consciousness is trying to strive for is really trying to move more towards a greater state of love and cooperation and just trying to be a better person than I was yesterday. So I believe that's kind of my purpose here on Earth and why we're here and what we're trying to do while we're here in the craziness of it all. Absolutely. I uh, agree with you in that I see consciousness as a way of perceiving, a way of interpreting, and a way of living. So we can have a consciousness of love, as you mentioned. We can have a consciousness of poverty. We can have a consciousness of addiction. We can have a consciousness of pain. And I, I think that a lot of Um, people, there are many people who have chosen a consciousness of survival, a consciousness of pain. And what it sounds like and looks like that you two are trying to teach and offer to folks is that there, there is a different way of life. There is the opportunity to learn about our own essence, our own being, and be have the opportunity to grow and to evolve our consciousness into love, into compassion, into understanding that there is no separation. Yeah, that's definitely our hope and what we're trying to get out there in our films. Absolutely. Now, how do how, what steps would you state that one could take in order to evolve their consciousness? Um, well, I would say just from, again, and just from what we're learning, and I really do think that Tom Campbell has a pretty good you know, theory on consciousness. Um, and I really think that that is just trying to, he uses the terms entropy as a scientific term. And, you know, things that have low entropy are very ordered. Things that have high entropy are disordered. So he kind of also goes into talking about, you know, things that are disordered um, and not organized are more of those feelings of fear and anger and disappointment, shame and guilt that we have. And when we get to a point where we're lowering that disorder, lowering the entropy, we find that we are becoming more love or loving. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think that really it's about just trying to be kind, trying to, you know, like a lot of the spiritual, you know, principles that you find really in any religion or any spiritual text. It's just how can you do good in the world? How can you make better choices? How can you make sure that you're not doing any harm onto others? And, you know, what is your intention behind your behaviors, your actions, your words, and how you how you move in the world? Mm-hmm. Certainly, and, and looking at how we are all connected as a part of humanity, and, and how there is, when you look at energy and the scope of energy, how there truly is no separation, and how to really learn that energy of self-love and self-compassion and love for others and being in service to others as well through that state of of love and compassion, Um, really looking at everything as a whole and looking at what is our own unique purpose. You were stating earlier that um, you feel that the part of a purpose is is to learn love. And I fully 
uh, know this to be true, that many people's purpose on some level is to learn how to love and to be um, more whole within themselves and you know, stop separating themselves into compartments and that everything else is out there, but uh, you know, to really understand that it's all within. I would agree, absolutely. Now, within your experience, uh, what you've seen going on, and for both of you, you, Michael, as well, what you've seen going on in the world, what would you say that attributes to so many people choosing to devolve instead of evolve? Well, I, what I see is a lot of, like, right now, if we like take something like, say, the election going on, I, I see a lot of ego in that. I mean, there's always a lot of ego going on in that stuff, but particularly the seems to be driven a lot by ego and I, I think everybody knows what I'm talking about mm-hmm. um, and it's kind of this uh, I see this you know this we're now in this reality show mentality where everything's connected and through the use of the internet now the the planet has a nervous system which reacts to things going on and if something bad you know that might not have gotten national news coverage maybe 20 years ago, it's now we, everybody has to hear about everybody's opinion about it, either through Twitter or Facebook or even a 24-hour news channel. So I think all these little pockets of what do we call it, ego or fear or de-evolving is really being mag- magnified right now. Mm-hmm. And I, I, overall, if you look at statistics, we are actually in probably the most peaceful time of our planet. Hmm. You know, looking at the media, that would surprise me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's, it is. Yeah, it's there's just part. so much stuff going on out there and just so much violence. But yes, yeah, certainly um, there have been times in our past where we have been much more animalistic and much more violent, for sure. And also, too, I, I, if you, I don't know if you've seen uh, the entire uh, The Path Evolution, the third film, there is a segment where Tom does talk about... Um, you know, if you look exactly what you said, if you look at the news now, it doesn't look very peaceful. Mm-hmm. But if you go back 300 years on the planet, it was a very difficult time to live. Um, it was a very, you know, a very much struggle uh, to, to survive, basically. And uh, I think now we're seeing, you know, these these other. Uh, I, I think in the film he calls it uh, bubbles of enlightenment pop up all over and now with using the internet and social media as a a tool we can actually make it use uh, use for positive uh, results Mm -hmm. and connect all these positive areas of enlightenment throughout the uh, throughout the planet yes certainly with um, social media the internet we have the biggest level of communication and and now I say big I mean like the scope of it we can talk to someone over in the continent of Africa. We can talk to someone uh, across the country here, over in California, in in you know in minutes. So we certainly have the ability to spread information much much faster than we ever have. And and I agree with you when we look at why do people choose to devolve. I think it does have a lot to do with ego, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, has a lot to do with feeling separate. I'm over here, you're over there, this is mine, this is yours, and don't touch what's mine. And that certainly is being fed into by the media, it's being fed into by the current state of politics, of um, of bullying, of uh, instigating more violence, of instigating more separateness, of instigating... Um, those people over there are going to come take your jobs. Just this continual feeding of fear and survival continues to really um, um, encourage people to devolve, unfortunately. Now, your film, Beyond the Physical, what is this one about? This one is more about the story of the Monroe Institute and the, uh, the early work of uh, Bob Monroe, uh, who his first book was Journeys Out of the Body. I'm, I'm sure probably a lot of your listeners are familiar with this. Uh, he, was, he was actually a big uh, New York City uh, NBC radio executive. Um, he, uh, I think, was multimillionaire. Uh, he retired from the 
uh, NBC and actually started a cable company out in uh, Virginia. And during this time when he was working, he had these spontaneous out-of-body experiences. And he went to journal it, which actually became his first book. And, and over time, he wanted to know what, why this was happening to him. At first, he thought it was, um, you know, his health was failing him. So he was seeing doctors and everything, and they said he was fine. And it, it turns out that he was having out-of-body experiences. And he built a lab around it, and this is where he recruited uh, Thomas Campbell, who was a, a physicist. At, at the time in a nearby uh, laboratory and he also recruited other engineers and um, scientists and uh, facilitators to actually experiment with um, this out-of-body experience and they were using sounds uh, actually in the very early days they didn't really know what was causing it but over time they discovered that it was um, they could get uh, pretty uh, good results using these sounds which actually became a hemisync which the institute uses now um, as their main uh, product. So, yeah, the, the, and then the story also follows um, Thomas Campbell, who, as I mentioned, uh, started out with Robert Monroe. Mm -hmm. uh, and then T Tom went on to leave the Institute and uh, actually study a very deep study of the nature of reality. And he, became, he came up with his own theory of everything, uh, which is the uh, My Big Toe trilogy. Uh, um, yes. Which is a very large book, uh, if you ever read it. And also, the, the, uh, the story also follows Skip Atwater, who joins in the, uh, I think it was the late set, actually, originally sent to the Institute to um, kind of just get information. Uh, the government was kind of curious about what was going on. Skip was a military, uh, I, I can't remember his ranking, but he was a military personnel. And so he went to the Institute just to see what they were doing and then actually became really good friends with Robert Monroe and actually worked at the Institute for a number of years. And he just retired in 2012, I believe. And it also uh, has William Buhlman, who during the, the mid-90s, actually the early 90s, uh, wrote a, a several, actually a few books, uh, Adventures Beyond the Body and Secrets of the Soul, uh, documenting his out-of-body experiences. And then I believe in, it was late 2009, the Monroe Institute had actually recruited William Gilman to run his own program at, at the Institute where people can go and actually learn right under William Gilman how to have out-of-body out experiences. Which so that's I basically the movie. Yeah, and which I know is very interesting um, in general, and I know it's very interesting to a lot of different people who have already had out-of-body experiences or they've heard of other people who have had it, and they're very curious about what that is like. And, and the part that I found, and I haven't watched that yet. I'm looking forward to watching that one next, Beyond the Physical. The piece that was written that I found very interesting was the where you mentioned the previously classified information regarding remote viewing that the military has been using. And so I did a little bit of research, um, very easy to find on the CIA's website. They have many documents that talk about it. I even printed off one of the letters by uh, Dr. Michael Kurtz, who discusses the release of the declassified information and that it's called Stargate among like three or four other names. And I find this very interesting, especially because um, there have been times in my own work that when I've been out and about um, and I've been seeing some let's non-physicals, I call them non-physicals, they're ghosts, they're deceased people, and I might communicate with someone, I've seen what I have been terming mental body projections. And they are people that I can see, but are not deceased. And so they're projecting their mental body projection. I didn't know that it was documented as a CIA activity. So I found it very, very interesting. I'll continue looking into that. But is there more regarding that particular activity that you were learning about in creating your documentary? Well, part of that goes along with just, um, we did have questions about what remote viewing was, but it turns out that, you know, in meeting Skip and learning about his history and then how he was led to the Monroe Institute, 
in the film, he was really able to give kind of the whole history of, of that classified project and how it worked and, you know, the things that the military was practicing because they got word that the Russian spies were kind of using this and wanted to make sure, well, if this is really something true and something that you can do, that we should probably know how to do that and train our own psychic spies. Um, so, you know, we became interested in that topic and thought that it really should be in the second film because that's also a way to once you understand energy and consciousness to understand that you know you can you can go to certain targets you can go to certain locations just without leaving your body you know and it can be used as a tool yes it certainly has been now i did read it, it supposedly ended in the 1990s but um you know they stated that mk ultra ended back in the 1970s and there's been documentation that that has not fully ended. But that's a completely different topic. Just fascinating information that I think people are really going to enjoy learning about in your documentary, all of them, but certainly that one beyond the physical. Beyond the physical is actually uh, a, kind of a fun movie. Uh, it was fun to make and it was actually fun to watch. It, it's kind of just just hearing these stories from these, uh, these people um, for the last... 30 years and, and their work is very interesting, I thought. Did you, do you have any out-of-body experiences, stories that you've heard that just really struck out and you thought, wow, that was awesome to hear about? Do you want to take that, Mike? Um, I, I don't have any that come to mind that, I mean, I did have a few that were just unusual, but I mean, it's kind of like your classic out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. Would you like to describe one? I, in some ways, I'm still kind of processing them. Mm -hmm. uh, like the one, the typical out of body experience will start. Um, and a lot of people report this. They they start with getting vibrations, and I get that a lot when they start. And notice that I I can feel myself like hovering over the bed, and the bed kind of just dropped out. And I was, I was like, it kind of dropped me into this. Uh, it, it might actually be like a lucid dream. To which there's some discussion on which is more, which is real, is the lucid dream or is it an actual out of body experience? Mm -hmm. and I was kind of like in this shopping center and nobody's really paying attention to me and it's just kind of weird, but I was very aware that it wasn't this physical world, it was this other other place. I don't, I don't know how to <laughs> explain it further than that. It, and uh, yeah, it. it and I always get the sense when this is happening that there is a figure always nearby. and I, I don't always see the figure, but I, I get the presence. I can hear them walking around, um, but I don't ever actually see them. And that, that's another common reported experience during these, these things is there's always somebody nearby. And they say it's your guide or it's another part of you, but mm -hmm. I, <laughs> I actually got to do more research myself to actually figure out what that is. Now, were these experiences that were spontaneous or something that you facilitated yourself? Uh, in the early days of this project, I, I tried to facilitate it a lot uh, on my own, which I really didn't get much luck. Mm -hmm. It was during Beyond the Physical, and there, there's a section where we were, in the film, we were making the, we do a demonstration of him saying how the tones in each of your are slightly different, and which creates a third tone in the center of your brain, which kind of syncs up your hemispheres of your brain. Doing that sequence of the film was right about the time I had the experience, because I was experimenting with sounds myself just to mix it right into the film. And it, it I think that's what triggered, started triggering these um, no, um, experiences that I didn't, necessarily start myself that mm -hmm. makes sense right right exactly okay that so, makes a, that yeah. makes a lot of sense so then after that i kind of became more relaxed with it now i just kind of accept it it's, you know in the middle of the night i just feel like the vibrations coming on i just kind of deal with it and just see where it goes mm -hmm. well, sometimes i'm too tired and you kind of push it away and other times you're like oh, okay yeah all right i can i can do this tonight you know and just kind of experiment with things and I know a lot of times it's probably just a lucid dream, but then there's other times where it's actually more real 
and then here in the physical, right? Um, the, the colors a little more vibrant, uh, and the sounds are just a little more real. I don't know how to explain that. That has been my experience. Uh, in having out of bodies, it's always been in the sleep state. It's always been more of a spontaneous nature. But the way I've been able to discern the difference, you know, is it a dream? Is it an out of body? It's like in an out of body, you have more control. You have more control over the choices that you're making, where you're moving, at least in my experience. Um, whereas in a dream, you feel a little bit less, you feel a little bit more influenced, I suppose, by a part of your brain. Um, that's forming the pictures that happen within a dream, but you know you just you don't have that control. Whereas this out of body experience, it just feels like you have that control, and it, it is very vivid. You feel almost like you're physically present, but obviously you're not physically present. Yeah, a fun story that I can recall, and I'm pretty sure that we put this in the second film, was um, you know Tom Campbell. Uh, was telling a story about one night he decided to pick his son up out of body because, you know, they talk about how children go out of body. Actually, they all go out of body every night. Um, But, you know, his intention was to meet up with his son in the out of body experience and kind of take him on a journey and play with him. And so what was funny was when he woke up, he told his wife, Pamela, what he had done, you know, with his son. Um, But what kind of blew her away was that Later on that morning, after the son woke up, the son had told her the entire story of, like, his dream and what he did with dad last night. So um, that kind of, like, blew her away. Was, they were both telling each other, telling her the same exact story of what had happened, and his son validated it, you know, later on that morning after he woke up. So I think that, that was a really fun story to hear. That's awesome. That would be really fun to hear. What is the takeaway that you would like people to have after watching your documentaries? Um, I think, I think part of it is just trying to have people take away, well, actually, I guess a couple of things. One, for them to know that they're more than their physical body. Um, I would be hoping, I would hope that our films would ignite more curiosity that people would use the films to go ahead and experiment more to kind of be like their own scientist and research this stuff and check it out and see if it's true for themselves. Um, you know, it's not necessarily like, uh, again, we quote a lot of what Tom says, but his stuff is so good. He says, you know, it doesn't get you anywhere to believe anything, but you really have to experience things for yourself in order to know them to be true for you. So I also hope that, you know, the first film takes away some fear of death for people. Um, You know, in the second film, having them to be curious, to explore and try the out-of-body experience. And then the third film, I really hope people's takeaway is, you know, to walk out from watching that film and just trying to feel motivated and really excited to be a better person and to be more loving. Excellent. And where can people find the documentaries? Uh, they can visit our website at thepathseries.com or path11productions.com. All the films are for sale there. Uh, the Path Evolution right now is only available on our website. The other two uh, films can be found on uh, Gaia, Gaia.com, uh, also on Amazon. And we, for the last film, we have uh, digital download streaming. So if you're not into buying DVDs anymore, you don't have a DVD player, you can uh, purchase the download. Are those all the places, Mike? We have iTunes. Yeah. Oh, Afterlife's on iTunes. Yeah. Um, uh, Yeah, the the Path Evolution, the last film, we also, when we put that out in June, this past June, we also added another 90 minutes of bonus interviews, stuff that we couldn't fit into the whole trilogy. Oh, wow. They're they're just really good stories. Um, Good things that... People have said that we just couldn't find a place in the film's form, but we didn't want to, you know, keep them set, uh, private. So, well, excellent. Like I stated earlier, the one that I watched beyond the physical, there was so much information in there that I've learned over the course of my work, over the course of growing up in the family that I grew up in, and just just a lot of really uh, seemed to me authentic individuals who wanted to share their knowledge. Well, thank you both, April and Michael, for being a guest on my show this week. 
Yes, thank you. Thanks for showing interest in our films and helping us to spread the word. We really appreciate it. You're welcome, and I want to thank the listeners as well for joining me here on Journey for Truth on iHeartRadio and YouTube. Until next time, have a fantastic week.